she's here with her baby. Which, who, Nora. Did, Nora, <laughs> who, w and is Nora in the, in the house? No, <laughs> Nora's probably oh, not being as good today, snapping. but she's tiny. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, she has a story to tell that is so compelling. Kayla, thank you for the, your courage to come forward. Thank so. you for having me. Yep. Um, so around 18 weeks, we had our normal anatomy scan, and we found out that our son had several fatal fetal anomalies. Um, this was a very wanted pregnancy. My husband and I were trying to have another baby. We have a three-and-a-half-year-old at home at the time she was two. Um, and when we found this out, it just happened to be two days after Idaho's trigger law went into effect. So we felt um, we were scared. We didn't know exactly what our options were. And the tense and devastating situation in the room with our physician, um, you could tell that she also did not know really what she could say or how she could help us in those moments. Um, we had to leave Idaho to come to the state of Washington so that we could meet our son. Um, and I want to make it abundantly clear that we did not want an abortion. We needed an abortion and we were not able to receive the care. Um, we had to take out a personal loan of $16,000 to be able to do this. Um, and I also understand that not a lot of women have access or the ability to be able to do that, which is the huge problem. Um, it really felt like insult to injury that we were forced to do that. Um, and these bans are really hurting many people. And so I'm honored to be here today with Senator Murray um, just to share a little bit of my story and um, hopefully allow others to know kind of what's going on that like abortion is really nuanced so it's not just black and white thank you thank you thank you for being here everyone a few weeks from now i'm going to get to hold my younger daughter in my lap as she squeezes her eyes shut makes a wish and blows out six candles on her birthday cake I get to have my nine-year-old run up and pull on my sleeve, begging for a piece without the frosting, because she doesn't like the frosting. I don't know how she's my daughter, but apparently <laughs> she does not like frosting on her cake. <clears throat> I'll cherish every moment of it, as I always do. This year, though, I already know that it will feel a little bit different, that I'll feel even more grateful than normal. Because, you see, after a decade of struggling with infertility, after my service in Iraq, I was only able to get pregnant through the miracle that is IVF. IVF is the reason that there are birthday cakes and birthday candles and birthday wishes and birthday gifts for both of my girls in the first place. But for countless women, that desperately sought after dream of becoming a mom became so much harder when the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that embryos in that state should be considered children under state law. Already, access to IVF has been thrown into chaos as countless would-be parents and their doctors try to figure out whether they might be criminalized for simply trying to start a family. A nightmarish yet logical next step in Republicans' decades-long campaign to overturn Roe, ban abortion, and take away our bodily autonomy. Meanwhile, the half-baked response that the Alabama state legislature has thrown together and recently uh, was signed by their governor is nothing more than an insult to IVF patients and common sense alike. <clears throat> it's a response that doesn't do anything to address the underlying issue of deeming that a fertilized egg is a child with more rights than the woman who has to bear that child. It won't even go, in, <clears throat> go so far as to say that IVF does not constitute manslaughter. At this point, now that the first domino has fallen, it seems like it could only be a matter of time before more extremists succeed in enacting even more dystopian policies nationwide that take away women's access to even the most basic reproductive care. You know, I was stationed in Alabama uh, for a bit when I was in the Army. And I didn't know it at the time, but infertility would become one of the most heartbreaking struggles of my life. My miscarriage, more painful than any wound I ever earned on the battlefield. So it's a little personal when a majority male court suggests that people like me, who are not able to have kids without the help of modern medicine, should be in jail cells and not nurseries. That's one reason why I am so grateful to have Dr. Amanda Adelier with me from Illinois as my State of the Union guest this year. Thank you. And we did not col color coordinate our dresses, by the way. <clears throat> Great minds do think alike. As a reproductive infertility specialist, Dr. Adelier has dedicated her life to doing this life-altering, life-affirming work. She knows what's right, even if extremist courts would like to rob millions of us of our rights. 
Even if far right groups would like to throw her into jail just for giving people like me the chance to experience even the most banal moments of parenthood. Just to have a newborn whose diaper needs changing, a toddler whose shoes need to be tied. Look, last week I tried to get the Senate to pass my Access to Family Building Act, legislation that would enshrine into law every American's right to become a parent via treatments like IVF. Republicans didn't hesitate even a moment before blocking it, despite the fact that they'd spent days prior shouting from the rooftops that they did support IVF. But their actions speak louder than their words, and their actions make it clear the hypocrisy and misogyny that defines today's GOP. So for Dr. Adele Yeshe, and for every would-be mom or dad out there, I will never stop pushing, clawing, and fighting to pass this bill, because every woman should have the right to be called mom without being called a criminal. And if my Republican colleagues ever decide to truly care about defending the sanctity of families like they claim they do, then they have an opportunity to prove it by helping turn my bill into law. And I'm so proud to have Dr. Amanda Delier here, and I'm going to ask her to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you so much to Chairwoman Murray and to Senator Duckworth for being incredible advocates for reproductive care and for supporting IVF. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, so what that means is I'm an OBGYN by training, but then I spend several extra years training on infertility. And the bread and butter of what I do is fertility care, and that includes in vitro fertilization or IVF. It's my passion to help people build the family of their dreams. And I was so disturbed when I saw what was happening in Alabama. Not only was I disturbed, but so were my colleagues, as were patients and future patients that could be affected by that Alabama Supreme Court decision. So my ask is really simple. It's clear that everyone here really wants people to be able to build families. And there's a simple way to do that. Let's allow access or confirm access for IVF care using Senator Duckworth's amazing bill, the Access to Family uh, Building Bill. And also, I think it's a really important time for us to recognize this is not only a woman's issue, but it's everyone's issue. And along with that, we want to make sure that fertility care is accessible to mm -hmm. everyone. And I'm so honored to be here today with these incredible people in order to hopefully make this a reality. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And I want to thank uh, Tammy for taking such a great lead on this issue and my other colleagues, uh, Brian and Patty. And there are many others who are on board on this issue. Um, thanks to my fellow senators, many of them senators and mothers, who have dedicated much of their career to fighting for women's health care. I'm proud to join in. And jo with me here today, and my guest at the State of the Union, is Kate Farley of Irvington, New York, in Westchester County. Kate's an attorney, a mother to baby Leo, three? Almost three. <laughs> almost three, and is 37 weeks pregnant um, uh, with a baby girl via IVF. Kate and her husband, David, have tried to have children after an agonizing process. They learned that Kate had a rare chromosomal, chromosomal issue that prevents roughly 80% of the embryos she produces from developing into a baby. Though Kate's embryos have the ability to grow, they can't develop for the past six to eight weeks, leading to potential miscarriage and heartbreak. Quite frankly, Kate's story shows as clear as day that an embryo is not a baby. Thanks to IVF, Kate and David's story is a happy one. They have a beautiful son. How dare these right-wing ideologues say that she shouldn't be able to have children or millions of other mothers who have beautiful children through the miracle of IVF, through the advances of medical science, and they don't want to allow it for whatever reason. Well, I'm here to say as majority leader, we are going to preserve the right to IVF, and we're not going to let these right-wingers take over and impose their views on beautiful women that we have here and millions more across America. Stories like Kate's make the Alabama Supreme Court's decision devastating. 
Republicans pushing that hard right agenda that takes away re reproductive health choices from families like Kate will not succeed because we are here as Democrats in the Senate, joined with some of our colleagues from the other side of the aisle to make sure they don't. But just yesterday, Republicans blocked legislation to protect access to IVF, just as they've blocked so many other bills preserving uh, reproductive care and protecting reproductive care. And IVF is just one piece of reproductive health care, contraception, IVF, abortion. Democrats are making sure that Americans have freedom to make their own choices for themselves and their families. Every one of us knows beautiful little children who have been born through the miracle of IVF. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. I know so many stories, so many, of people who tried and tried, and finally IVF brought them the beauty of being a parent. So we can't let this happen. We can't let these ideologues impose their views on America, and particularly on American women. Alex McGill Johnson, the president of Planned Parenthood, will also be one of my guests for SODU, State of the Union, called SODU. <laughs> Her leadership on reproductive care issues is remarkable. Planned Parenthood is one of the great beacons preserving a woman's right to health care and the right to choose uh, throughout America. And we're all going to stand together and hold Republicans accountable for their attacks on reproductive freedom. Together, Senate Democrats are going to work to make sure families have happy endings like Kate and David. Well, and another happy ending, God willing, happening very soon. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So let me turn to Kate uh, so she can tell you personally what this means. This is, so this is not an abstract issue. It's real folks, real people. I have to say that when I read the Alabama decision, I cried because it denies the scientific reality that I have experienced and that other women every day across the U.S. experience. If an embryo was a baby, automatically, there would be so much less heartbreak in the world. People don't talk about miscarriage, but up to it's thought that actually up to one in four pregnancies end in a miscarriage. And this is a secret, painful battle that many people are fighting. And there are some of the purest and best humans that I know working tirelessly in scientific labs and in research across the country to improve our chances of having a baby. I was raised Catholic and I believe God works through people and these people are doing God's work. And to say that these people who have helped done nothing other than to help their fellow man, their fellow humans should not be allowed to administer a medical treatment to a, fa a couple who so desperately wants to have a child is an anathema. We can't let it stand. I believe in a woman's right to choose. My choice to have a baby, I felt like was taken away from me. I wanted one so bad that I couldn't have it. And IVF gave me that choice back. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank you Kate. Okay. Brian? Thank you, Leader Schumer. Thank you. I'm going to have to go. Okay. You wanna, are you going to come back with me? Or you? Um, hmm? She's not sure. Okay. <laughs> yes, you're coming with us. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Leader Schumer. Thank you, Senator Murray. Thank you, Senator Duckworth and the extraordinary parents and doctors um, who are united in this cause. Republicans are going after all of it. Abortion, medication abortion, IVF, contraception, all of it. And it is women and families who are being punished as a result. Whether they're trying to get pregnant, stay healthy while pregnant, or end an unintended or risky pregnancy. They face impossible choices. Do you risk your own health with a high-risk pregnancy or do you risk being thrown in jail 
for trying to get an abortion? Do you stay in a state that forces you to carry for months a non-viable pregnancy to term? Or do you travel hundreds of miles in secret to access a legal abortion? As the doctors up here know better than anyone, attacks on abortions threaten the entire system of reproductive care, even things like family planning programs and early miscarriage care. Hospitals and doctors are terrified now. Hospitals and doctors are terrified of providing the kind of care that will lose them their license or land them in jail. For instance, if you are an OBGYN in a state like Texas, you might be forced to delay or deny treatment to a patient with an ectopic pregnancy. Because there's enough gray area that the state can arbitrarily decide that you broke the law and punish you for providing care. So it's entirely understandable that OBGYNs in these states are quitting, retiring early or moving to a state that doesn't make criminals out of them. Because of extreme Republican policies, women and families can't get the care that they need, even when their lives are at risk. Republicans coming after it all and they will not stop. But all of us here will continue fight for as long as it takes until abortion rights are finally codified into federal law. With that, I wanna turn it over to my guest, Dr. Olivia Manayan. Dr. Manayan was born and raised in Honolulu and is an OBGYN chief resident at the University of Hawaii, where she'll be specializing in complex family planning. Dr. Manayan. Thank you so much, Senator Schatz. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So as he said, I'm a complex family planning fellow to be, which means that I will specialize in abortion care, as well as complex contraception and reproductive justice. I am honored and grateful to be with you all today and to know that across the country, I am joined by an army of strong, indomitable allies in the fight to restore and liberate reproductive health and bodily autonomy. The decision made by the Alabama Supreme Court, which refers to IVF embryos as unborn children, is filled with relig religiously charged, carefully chosen language, which attempts to establish a false precedent that life begins at fertilization. It is clear when reading the opinion put forth by the Chief Justice that the consequences this decision would not have on that this decision would have not only on individuals seeking IVF services but also on those who provide them were not carefully considered. Theology and ideology have no place in the court, uh, especially when Bible quotes are used as data in order to um, publish a Supreme Court decision. Uh, in the same vein, politicians have no place in the doctor-patient relationship or in the relationship an individual has with her body. Every person with a uterus has the right to decide if and when she bears children. This decision is hers alone to make. To deny her this right is to mark her as a second-class citizen. By forcing a person to, to be a slave to her fertility, you deny her the ability to fully exercise her inalienable rights to life, liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. The Alabama decision, the Dobbs decision, and subsequent legislation being passed in some states to restrict abortion does just that. The sole objective of these cases is to exercise control over women's bodies. Just as the Alabama decision led to harmful repercussions, so too do all abortion bans. Abortion bans do not stop abortions, they just prevent safe ones from happening. Women in this country are increasingly dying pregnancy-related preventable deaths. If we continue to restrict abortion, as well as reproductive health training, this problem will only get worse. Until we see the, prior, the prioritization of female human life in this country, I will continue to advocate for rights that we deserve. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood, Alexis McGill Johnson. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor to be here with all of you senators. Thank you so much. You have been incredible, unwavering champions for reproductive rights and freedom. And I'm particularly honored as a fellow New Yorker to be the guest um, of uh, the Senate Majority Leader during the State of the Union address. 
uh, tonight. We are living through just an unbearable moment at this time, one that requires every leader to protect reproductive freedom. In less than two years since Roe v. Wade was overturned, 21 states have restricted access to abortion, banned, restricted, and criminalized access to abortion care, leaving one out of three women plus more trans and non-binary folk without access to care in their states. And what we have seen in less than two years is how abortion bans make pregnancy more dangerous, how miscarriage gets criminalized, and how all aspects of our reproductive freedom, including IVF, are under attack. This is unacceptable, and the harm to patients and to providers is unconscionable. Now more than ever, with reproductive freedom under attack from birth control to IVF to abortion care, we need full-throated support and action from our leaders in the White House, through the halls of Congress, and on the court benches throughout this country. Whether, when, and how we decide to build our families, determine the course of our own futures, and whether we'll be able to participate as full and equal members of society is what is at stake. We are grateful for the many steps that the Biden-Harris administration has taken to protect patients and providers during the abortion crisis, uh, access crisis, post-ops. And we're grateful to all of the Senate lead leaders um, as the ones before us who have been champions in Congress, who continue to do all they can to help patients get the support and accurate information. Calling for votes, making sure members have access to education, support, and stories to understand the impact. Having conversations with our patients, with our providers, and understanding what's really going on on the ground. Your thoughtful leadership and your incredible partnership reminds us that we are not alone in this fight, and we also know we are not going to continue to go back. We are not going to back down from this fight. We know that the majority of Americans are on our side, and we're going to continue to fight with you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone who's participated today, and we're happy to take any questions. Yes. On IVF in particular, we asked for unanimous consent last week uh, to all the Republicans who said, oh, no, I support IVF, who blocked it. That prevented us from doing it. Every single one of us here knows that we have tremendous challenges on the floor today to just get our actual business that we have to get done done, our appropriations bills and other items. To br he, they made it very clear that if we were to bring this bill up, it would take weeks on the floor. They would use every procedure. So the answer is simple to all the Republicans who say they support IVF. Don't block the bill. Let's pass it. Well, not unless the Republicans allow us to bring it up. And right now they're saying no. Well, uh, let me make it very clear. The president has done as Alexis said everything we've asked him to do that he's capable under the current law. What we all know ultimately needs to be done is to restore Roe to the law of the land, and I'm, I expect that he will say that tonight. Yes. On appropriations, would you expect to vote on that bill today or what's your outlook? <laughs> On an entirely different topic. Um, uh, so what we are waiting for is for the Republicans to determine whether or not they're going to use all the time. And, and under our rules, they have uh, under cloture will not ripen until tomorrow morning. And then uh, we have they have the opportunity to offer amendments. They have not yet given us a list, and we're working through that right now. We all know the deadline tomorrow night. We're working very well on the remaining six bills. There's a number of really hard decisions to be made. There were on these bills. We just have to work through them one at a time. And to show us we did last night in the House, we've got the votes for this. Let's just make these decisions, and uh, let's get these bills done. May I ask one more on topic? You could. I know in, in the first tranche of the six bills, there are quite a few reproductive rights and abortion matters that the House put on. Anti-abortion, thank you. Yes. That dropped off. Yes. What is the outlook on those? 
Oh, I've made it very clear from day one throughout the negotiations, we will not accept any, not one, not tiny, not little, not big abortion writer on these bills and have made that very clear. It's why we have six bills today without any on it, and we will have six more, more without any on it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your hard work. It's wonderful to meet you. I mean, it's very remarkable. Right on point. Thank you for sharing yours as well. Thank you so much. I didn't want to mention it. I could never have gone into Pono, but that's okay. Thank you so much. Happy birthday to your six year old. Yes, yes, thank you. Let me know what you need. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I had imagined you. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Be nice. Very nice to meet you. Let me know what you need. Okay, I'll see you later.